And so I really appreciate uh, our tech crew, Chris and Billy specifically, who kind of tried to, you know, spend some hours figuring out what was going on and getting everything fixed and ready to go for this morning. So um, yeah, I'm really glad that everyone's here. I know we've got some guests who are here with us for the first time. And so if you are a guest with us, uh, we would love to connect with you. And the easiest way to do that is to have you text the word welcome to 833-276-5450. What you'll get back from us is a text message that includes a link to a digital connection card. We just ask for uh, just some really simple information. And we do that because we'd love to, to be an encouragement to you. Um, as we say it, we want to see your faith come alive. And so whatever we can do for that, uh, to that end, we want to do that. And so I always tell people, if you have questions, feel free to ask. Um, I would love to, to answer any questions that you have about our church uh, or about maybe something that you hear in the message this morning as well. And if you are new with us today or newer with us, you are also invited to hang out afterwards for just a couple of minutes um, at what we refer to as first steps. And so that's going to take place right after the service over to the left at the tables over there. Um, and so it's just an opportunity for you to ask questions about the church, maybe hear a little bit more about who we are, and then maybe some of the things that um, happen outside of Sundays that you can be involved in as well. Um, so we're excited that you're here. I'm going to get into the message here in just a minute, but before I do, I want to pray for us um, and pray specifically this morning for uh, one of the families in our church, Mike and Celeste Armistead, who, along with their daughter Tucker, are leaving Wednesday to head to uh, Nepal and visit one of our uh, missions that we support over there in Nepal. And so, um, you know, they're traveling to the other, other side of the world, and so it's a, a lot of flights to get there and stuff like that. And so um, we just want to pray for them this week for their trip, that everything um, goes well as they get there, and then um, that their trip is um, productive as well. So let's pray, and then we'll jump into the message. Father, again, we thank you so much for who you are, for the grace that you extend to us in spite of the fact that we don't deserve it. Thanks for the opportunity to gather together today uh, to sing praise to your name. And Father, as we have uh, sung this morning, I pray that, um, like Miranda sort of encouraged us, that the, the words that we sang we would be reflecting on, and um, that God, ultimately, those things would make a lasting impact in our lives. And Father, I do pray for Mike and Celeste and Tucker as they leave for Nepal on Wednesday. Uh, just keep them safe as they travel. I pray that just the planes would be on time and so there wouldn't be um, complications in that way and that they would just be a, a, a blessing to the missionaries that they come into contact with, the people that they serve as well, and, and that God, through this, you would be um, at work through them and in them at the same time. Father, as we spend a few minutes in your word today, I pray that you would uh, quiet our hearts, that we'd be able to hear from you, and that you would continue to mold us and shape us so that we become more like Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. The people that sat down on that bus stop that day had no idea what they were getting ready to experience. From their perspective, they saw a man who was nicely dressed in a light-colored suit with a small suitcase sitting next to him and a box of chocolate in his hand. But for everybody that sat down on that bench next to him, they heard part of an incredible life story. It was a story that began as a little boy with him being told all of the things that he could not do because of a well below average IQ and then physical limitations. But it was a story that took him around the world what seemed like three different times. Run, Forrest, run. That was the encouragement of Jenny as he began to run away from his bullies. This is sort of this first scene that he begins to understand who he is as he begins to run so fast that the braces on his legs just fall apart because they can't keep up with him. He continued to run, and he ran all the way to the University of Alabama where he became an All-American football player, and then ran to the Vietnam War and continued to run into the line of fire to save his comrades including Lieutenant Dan. Later, he ran across the United States and back again, just because. And he continued to run. And it, it's it, the, the journey of a, a man who seemed at random to end up at the right places to be included in the most iconic historic events of his entire lifetime. And so he was able to share his story that day with those people that sat, sat down next to him and offer them a chocolate from the box that he was holding where he told them, Mom always said, life is like a box of chocolates because you never know what you're going to get. 
Now, I'll, I'll tell you, I, as I share that this morning, I am basing, uh, I'm working off the assumption that most of us have seen the movie Forrest Gump before. I know it was released in 1994, and I didn't really uh, survey our young adults, but I'm assuming, Ronnie, that uh, you have seen this because it's such a classic movie that everyone in every generation needs to watch it. But for those of you that remember watching it for the very first time, I, I wonder what you thought. You probably thought it was an entertaining movie, a really interesting story, probably times where you laughed, the other times where you cried. I wonder if you thought about your own life as you watched it. Because I'll tell you, there were times that I, as I watched it, I thought, man, I would love to experience something like that. And then with other things, I thought to myself, I hope I never have to experience something like that. But through it all, at the end of the movie, we're able to see this incredible adventure story in Forrest Gump's life. You know, I, I want to tell you something that I believe. I believe that God is writing a story in your life, too, that is an epic adventure. Now, to be able to see it, you've got to take a step back and gain a different perspective on your life. Because when you're in it, what we see is just a series of random events. Maybe sometimes they're based off of choices that we make as we face those fork in a road sort of decisions. And because we live in a fallen world and, and we're sinful people, none of us experience exactly God's perfect plan for us, but yet at the same time, in the midst of everything, the good, the bad, the ups and the downs, the right choices, the wrong decisions that we make, I believe that God is in the background orchestrating the events of our lives so that we become exactly who God wants us to be. I want you to know God cares far more about who we are than he does about what we do. And so God brings us through experiences that shape us. Leads us to encounter the right people at the right time that influence us. And at some point in that life story, we have an encounter with Jesus that changes everything. But for many of us, we look back at that day. For some of us, like me, look back to when we were kids. Maybe others look back to when you were a teenager. Maybe some look back to when you were an adult, or maybe even a day that happened not too long ago. But then I believe that there are potentially others who can't look back, but what you can do is look forward. And the reason I say that is because where you are right now, you're not really sure what you believe. In fact, maybe you're not even sure why you're here. Maybe somebody invited you to come. Maybe the circumstances of your life have gotten to the point where you're searching for answers, something that would help, and you thought maybe the church could provide the help that you're looking for, but you're really not sure. I believe that you're not here by accident. But I believe that God is doing something in your life, orchestrating the events of your life to lead you to the right place at just the right time so that you have an encounter with Jesus and your life is changed forever. And maybe today is that day. We're beginning a new series this morning. Just, it's simply called Changed. As we near the end of Jesus' life, at the time of the crucifixion and then through the resurrection, Jesus has encounters with several different people. Different people, different backgrounds, different experiences. But as a result of their interaction with Jesus and their encounter with Jesus, their lives were changed. And there's so much that we can learn from all of those different experiences. And so that's what we're going to do over the next couple of weeks. But today we begin with the story of a man that is commonly referred to as Simon the Cyrene. His story is found for us in Luke's Gospel in Luke chapter 23. Verses 26 through 31. So I'll read those verses in just a second. If you've got a Bible, you can turn there. Luke chapter 23, verses 26 through 31. If you don't have a Bible with you, it'll be on the screen as I read it. Or if you've got the YouVersion Bible app on your phone, you can follow along um, in our live event there. But here is 
the story of Simon the Cyrene in Luke's gospel. As they led him away, they seized Simon, a Cyrenian. He was coming from the country, and they laid a cross on him to carry behind Jesus. A large crowd of people followed him, including women who were mourning and lamenting. But turning to them, Jesus said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. Look, the days are coming when you will say, Blessed are the womb, are, are the women without children, the wombs that have never bore, the breasts that have never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountain, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen? When it's dry. The story of Simon the Cyrene is a, a story of what seems to be a random encounter that changed Simon's life forever. Now, if because of where we picked up the story, if all that you knew was what we just read, you knew nothing of what happened before or what is getting ready to happen, you might wonder how did these two end up at that place at that time? Well, what I want you to know, what might seem like a random event, was anything but a random event for Jesus. Jesus' ministry lasted approximately three years, was not very long at all. And I'm sure that when Jesus began his ministry, there were certain things that he said that seemed strange to people. But yet at the same time, he was performing miracles, he was healing people. He was teaching as someone who had authority, which was something that people hadn't experienced in generations. So there was so much hope and excitement. It was clear that Jesus was a prophet, an instrument of God. But the problem was, even from the very beginning, he pushed against the status quo in the normal way that people did things. Now, for us, as we read them, there are certain things that we would look at and say, I don't understand why that was such a big deal, like Jesus healing on the Sabbath. Because we look at an event like that and say, well, wouldn't it make sense for God to want us to do good things for people, even if it happens to be on the Sabbath? But then there were certainly other things that Jesus did that if you put yourself in the position of a religious leader on the inside, you would say, I get it. I understand why they were really upset by those things. Because one of the things that Jesus did is he constantly hung out with the wrong kinds of people. He was known as being a friend to sinners. He would eat with tax collectors and sinners, which, again, if you're a, a religious person on the inside of that system, you could look at it and say, well, just doing that, eating with people, in some sense, condones their behavior. How many times do we hear things like that in our world today? But it wasn't just tax collectors and sinners, because Jesus also ministered to a Samaritan woman. Jews didn't have anything to do with Samaritans, and rabbis never taught women. And he told the story of a good Samaritan, where a Samaritan was a hero, as opposed to the religious leaders. By the time that Jesus' ministry ended, he began to speak out more and more against the religious leadership of his day. And in fact, he did it often the last week of his life. And while Jesus often taught in parables or stories, so maybe some people didn't exactly understand what he was saying, the religious leadership did. One day, Jesus told the story of a landowner who lent out his vineyard to some tenant farmers. And at harvest time, the landowner sent one of his servants to collect what belonged to him, the portion of the harvest that belonged to him. But those tenant farmers, they didn't want to give the landowner what belonged to him. They wanted to keep everything for themselves, and so they beat that servant and sent him away. They, the landowner then sent another, and they did the same thing. And then as Jesus told the story, he says it in this way, the landowner said to himself, I will send my son because surely they will respect my son. But when they saw the son coming from a long way off, they gathered together and said, you know what, if we kill that son, there will be no heir, and the land will be ours. And the religious leadership knew exactly what Jesus was talking about. 
because he was talking about them. He was challenging their power. Just the common order of things. And so Jesus had to be stopped. Eventually, one of Jesus' own disciples, Judas, agreed to betray him. Jesus was arrested, then taken before the Jewish ruling council known as the Sanhedrin, brought up on charges of blasphemy, claiming to be God. They quickly found him guilty and sentenced him to death. The problem was the Sanhedrin couldn't carry out the sentence because only Rome reserved the right to put people to death. And so Jesus was taken before Pilate. The problem was Rome didn't care about a religious fanatic, so the charges had to be changed from claiming to be God to claiming to be king. Pilate questioned him for a while, didn't feel like there was anything that was worthy of him being put to death. The problem was there was a large mob that was growing outside of Pilate's residence, and they were shouting, crucify him, crucify him. In seeking to appease the crowd, Pilate had Jesus whipped and beaten. But nothing would stop the crowd. They continued to shout. And eventually, Pilate acquiesced to their demands and sentenced Jesus to be crucified. And all criminals who were sentenced to crucifixion would then have been forced to carry their cross through the streets to the place of their execution. But I want you to know this was anything but random for Jesus. He knew exactly what he was doing. Because he had even once said, I have not come to be served, but to serve, and to give my life as a ransom for many. Jesus was laying down his life. But for Simon, though, it does seem far more like a random encounter. As we're introduced to Simon, we know him as Simon the, from Cyrene. The text tells us he is Simon a Cyrenian who was coming in from the country. Those details tell us a, a couple of things. So he's a, from Cyrene, the town of Cyrene, which to us probably doesn't mean anything, but it's a really significant detail. It's a town in northern Africa in what is in modern-day Libya. And so that helps us to see that it is entirely possible because of where he was from that he, before this event, he had no idea who Jesus was. He'd never encountered Jesus before. And it says he was coming from the country, meaning that that week he was staying outside of the city of Jerusalem. So it's entirely possible not only that Simon didn't know who Jesus was, never had any kind of encounter with him before, it is entirely possible until he was ripped from the crowd that he had no idea what was taking place that morning. Simon was there like so many others to celebrate the Passover. Passover was a celebration of the goodness of God, the, the faithfulness of God when he rescued the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt. And for centuries, people had traveled from around the region and, and really ultimately around the world, had traveled to the city of Jerusalem for the purpose of celebrating the goodness of God. The events that we read this morning happened on Friday. Likely on Thursday, Simon had made his way into the city of Jerusalem to go to the temple and worship. And then later in the evening, he would have gathered with his own family to celebrate the Passover meal. It's likely that he slept in a little bit on Friday morning before making his way back into the city of Jerusalem again on his way to the temple to worship. But as he made his way into the town, he came up upon this large crowd that was gathered. Maybe he wasn't even sure why they were there. And before he knew it, he was ripped from the crowd and forced to carry the cross of Jesus. Honestly, the text doesn't give us a lot of details, and so we're left to just kind of imagine what the color of the story actually was. When Simon came upon this crowd, there would have been a, a procession in the road. 
included Jesus along with the two other criminals that were crucified with him that day. Likely in addition to that were some of the religious leaders that had sentenced Jesus to death and along with Roman soldiers that made sure that all three of those criminals got to where they needed to go. If Simon saw Jesus coming up the road, he would have seen a man who was struggling under the weight of the cross. He saw his face that had been puffy and swollen. His torso was exposed, and so as he approached, Simon could see the flesh from his arms and his back that had just been ripped open. Maybe it was right in front of the spot where Simon was standing in the crowd that Jesus collapsed, unable to continue on. With a look of disgust, one of the Roman soldiers would have quickly scanned the crowd looking for someone who looked like they were strong enough that they would be able to carry the cross the rest of the way. And again, without any warning, that's when Simon was grabbed by his outer robe and just jerked from the crowd and commanded, you carry his cross. So Simon picked up the cross for Jesus. And did you notice in the text it said, and he followed behind Jesus. As Luke is writing the life story of Jesus, there is without a doubt a connection between what is happening here with something that Jesus had said previously. Because Jesus once said, if anyone wants to be my disciple, he must come after me deny himself, and take up his cross and follow me. And so what Simon was doing was literally doing what all followers of Jesus have to do. He picked up the cross and was following Jesus. To take up the cross, it's a sign that you're actually willing to lay your life down. Because we often think that the cross is a symbol of love and devotion. That's what it is for us today. But when Jesus said, you've got to take up your cross, the cross was a sign of death. To take up your cross is, means that you die to yourself, die to the, the things that you desire for the sake of the things that God desires for you. It's a total surrender of everything to the will of God. The Apostle Paul said it this way in Galatians 2.20. He said, for I'm crucified with Christ, it's the death, but nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me, and the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and in this life that we have, live by faith or follow Jesus. In addition to just what Simon did and what he saw, we have also some details about what Simon heard. Because as Jesus was walking down this road, there were some women who were mourning and lamenting. These were most likely professional mourners. When I say that, I don't mean that they were paid to do what they were doing, but they were just a group of women who did this because this is what you do when someone dies. You mourn. It was part of the culture. And so it wasn't that they cared so much about Jesus that they had to go and they were mourning for him because he meant so much to them, but that this is just what you do. So regardless of who was walking down that road that day, they were going to be there and they were going to mourn. And so Jesus turned to that group of women and he said, don't weep for me but weep for yourselves and for your children. And when Jesus said that, I don't think he was speaking specifically only to those women, but in, in more generalities to all of the people who were gathered there in Jerusalem. People that didn't know what they were doing. They didn't know that they were putting their Messiah to death. Though the evidence for who Jesus was was right in front of them, they didn't see it. They couldn't believe it. But I believe that what 
Simon heard that day had a lasting effect on him because he heard someone who wasn't concerned about himself as much as he was about other people. And the the heart behind it, the, the humility, the compassion that were behind those words left a lasting effect on Simon. Soon they made their way to the place that we know as Golgotha, the place where Jesus would be crucified. Simon laid down the cross and Jesus was lifted up. But we don't read any more about Simon. So we're left to speculate. And did he leave right away as soon as he was finished with his task? Did he stay watching as Jesus breathed his last breath? And we don't know those things, but I do believe that his life was changed as a result of his encounter with Jesus. And though in the biblical text, we never read about Simon again. Church history can help us out a little bit in this. Because according to church history, Simon made his way back home and began to tell everyone about his encounter with Jesus and became a missionary throughout northern Africa. And there's actually a little bit of a clue in the biblical text that, that may actually be the truth. Because in Mark's gospel, as Mark tells this same story about Simon and his encounter with Jesus, he's referred to as the father of Alexander and Rufus. And the only reason that Mark would have included those details is if Alexander and Rufus were two people that were known within the early church. Rufus's name is also mentioned in Romans 16, if in fact it's the same Rufus. It's a story of a random, what seemed to be a random encounter that was anything but random. It's a story Simon, who encountered Jesus, and his life was changed forever. And I believe that God is writing an epic adventure story in your life, bringing you through some circumstances that shape who you are, having you to encounter the right people at just at the right time, so that at some point in your life, you have an encounter with Jesus that changes everything. And that change is solely based off of the person and work of Jesus. It's based on who he is and what he came to do. So who is Jesus to you? You know, there are a lot of people who would tell you that the Jesus of the Bible, that's just a legendary figure. Jesus may have lived, but he certainly didn't do all the things that we read about in Scripture. I don't believe that that's the case, though. I believe that Jesus did all of the things that the Bible says that he did. I believe that, the, that Jesus is who the Bible says he is, that he's the son of God who came to lay down his life as a ransom for us. So what do you believe that Jesus did? Again, I'll tell you that I believe that Jesus died on that cross in our place so that our sins could be forgiven, and in doing so, he secured our freedom. And it's our faith in Jesus, the person and work of Jesus that sets us free, allows us to have a relationship with God that should change everything about us and last forever. And some of us need to look back at that day. We need to look back at that day that we encountered Jesus and our lives were changed. The reason being is because as we go through the trials of life, it's really easy to fall into a pattern where we're living according to a different set of 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 values than the ones that Jesus gave to us. Sometimes we forget about the transformation that Jesus wants to bring about in our lives, and so we need to take time to remember. Remember that decision. Remember that encounter when our lives were changed forever. But some others need to look forward. Look forward to that day where you finally say yes to Jesus. It's really simple. The Bible tells us by faith we enter into a relationship with God that changes everything and it lasts forever. A simple message of the gospel. We don't have to have all of our questions answered, but just believe that when we could do nothing, Jesus accomplished everything. So that we could be forgiven, find freedom, and our lives are changed forever. So has your life been changed? Heavenly Father,